fiction. So that was what uh, created or shaped my reading experiences before I became a student of literature in English. Then when I was 18, I could finally take literature as a subject. Oh, sorry. Uh, try moving to a better network. OK, I'm getting <laughs> comments about network quality. Hang on. Uh, Suli, is it OK? Are you, am I breaking up? Not yet. You sound all right so far. Oh, OK. So let's see whether my. Uh, but please do let me know via WhatsApp lah, if anything happens here. Yeah? OK, um, right. So now to the second phase as a literature and English student. So uh, having had all those books that I read as a child, once I became a student of literature, I was very eager. I went to class, always reading. So I studied the classics as expected, as I expected. So I did Shakespeare, I did Jane Austen, Thomas Hardy, William Wordsworth, William Blake, all the big names, right? And I loved reading them. Uh, but when it came to what or how I should read them, that was a learning curve. So I had to learn how to do literary analysis. So that was a big jump for me. But at the same time, what I was expected to read uh, went beyond just those uh, the canon, really. In my syllabus in Malaysia, we were expected to read texts from Malaysian authors. We had to read texts from um, West Indies, authors from the West Indies, an author from Africa, and so on and so forth. So it was a actually a very broad spectrum in terms of our reading experiences. However, I did not like reading them. I honestly, especially the Malaysian texts, I could not understand actually why I had to read them because I did not enjoy them as enjoy reading them as much as I enjoyed Wordsworth for example. So at that time, I thought it was a matter of preference, like I just prefer uh, authors from England. That could have been it. However, as then, then I became a literature and education researcher after the, and during my PhD, and my research after that made me reflect on my, ex, my responses to such texts because I wasn't alone. When I was doing my PhD research, I would interview students who were studying the same subject I was, so basically my juniors. And they would tell me the same thing. They did not, did not like the Malaysian text. They did not like the, the African text. They wondered why they had to read them because it was not enjoyable. And one participant even called it rubbish. I know, very strong word. And I, I loved digging into the layers beneath that. but. Like I said, I wasn't alone in my response towards Malaysian literature and English, especially. And then I came to realize I was as I was writing this chapter. My uh, what I was responding to wasn't actually the fact that they come from Malaysia or they come from a place other than England. I was responding because of my conceptualization of what literature is meant or is supposed to be. So because of my experiences growing up, it had primed me to read a certain way and to read for certain things. So when I read texts that didn't meet those, I tended to dismiss them, which is quite sad, come to think of it. But now, as uh, so in this chapter, I talk a lot about that. I give uh, examples from all the research I've done since I finished my PhD. And I just wanted to sum up uh, the, I think, the main points I tried to make in the chapter, which is the first question, what books to read? In terms of that question, I think Malaysia has uh, progressed because they've already included texts from post-colonial countries, texts from authors who may not be the main names that you see on booker list prizes and so on and so forth. But how we read them, on the other hand, has not actually changed. So the idea that we just have to do literary analysis to me is not enough in literature education. I think we need to have a very direct engagement and discussion with students about what literature is, what is defined as literature, and and uh, more importantly, I guess, 
what I'm trying to argue for is that we have to move beyond just a cultural explanation for things where it's just, uh, oh, you must understand the culture of the text, you must understand the, your culture that you have experiences as, experienced as a reader, to the idea that literature itself is a very abstract concept that needs to be discussed and conceptualized with students. And I believe that from that discussion, if I had that discussion when I was a student, I would be better prepared to engage with the Malaysian literature and English texts. That was what I felt helped me back from actually really engaging and delving into and appreciating texts that were not what I expected. So you can read about all that in my chapter and I hope that you will get the book. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Grace. And we move now to the last um, speaker. Dr. Yishan Tsai. Uh, Yishan is um, actually originally from Taiwan, but she's currently in Edinburgh, so University of Edinburgh in UK. Yishan? Yeah, can everybody hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Okay, cool. I'm also having my camera on just uh, shortly, <laughs> so that it feels like there is a real person behind the camera. Um, so first of all, thank you everyone for staying to until now, the last speaker. Um, I like to think that there is a, a silver lining to this pandemic that it seems to connect us uh, better through the web space and that uh, it seems more and more common to have this kind of um, webinars to connect people from all over the world. So good morning, good evening, good afternoon and um, hello everybody. Um, okay. I I will turn my camera off just now and um, share my, my desktop. Okay. Um, can you see my slide? Yes. Yeah? Okay, yeah. cool. Um, yeah, so just a little bit uh, about myself. Um, as Sully said, I am currently based in, U in the UK. Um, so I moved here after finishing my PhD in Cambridge, although I will soon be moving to Australia, Melbourne, where the pandemic is, is quite bad at the moment. Uh, I'll be moving to Monash University soon. Um, my current research focuses on digital education, particularly social and cultural issues around the use of big data in education, also known as uh, learning analytics. Um, so I authored this chapter called The Role of Comic Books in Literacy Education in Taiwan, which is um, an extended study from my PhD work. Um, so my PhD study looked into British teenagers' engagement with manga um, in social, cultural, and literary aspects. And in this chapter, instead of talking about British readers, I talked about myself um, as a child reader, my engagement with manga, and the overall status of comic books in the literacy education in Taiwan. So in a nutshell, this chapter includes a brief history of the development of comic books in Taiwan, the struggles of comic books, uh, local comic books for social recognition, and the inseparable influence from Japanese comic books, which are uh, also known as manga. Um, and I also include some examples about how we can use comic books for literacy education. Um, so as you can see on the slides, uh, manga is also uh, called, known as manhua in Taiwan, uh, in Mandarin Chinese. Um, so I thought the best way for me to uh, introduce this chapter is perhaps just to show you this, um, the, an outline of it. The, 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 this chapter is organized in six sections um, and starting with my a brief account of my childhood reading experience and how comic books, particularly manga, became a guilty pleasure in an exam-driven reading culture. Um, so this is even more so in my family where uh, my parents, both of my parents only had primary education and my grandparents on both sides were illiterate. So to my parents, the, the only way to, for their children to get out of the kind of lifestyle 
gifts that they have is for the children to study very hard in school and get good grades and go to university and be able to get a job in the office. So something my dad used to tell me is that you must study hard so that when you grow up, you will hold a pen instead of a tool. Um, so my dad didn't know that these days I use computer keyboards, not a pen, <laughs> not, not that much anymore, but you get the idea. Um, so comic books really, are, um, I would call them a guilty pleasure that I, I had to read secretly. Um, so that's the, the, the beginning of this chapter, just give you a, a snapshot of what it, it's a snapshot of what it, what it was like for me as a child reader, um, despite the requirement to the expectations to read high Chinese literature, um, I still derive some pleasure from reading comic books on my own time, in my own time. Um, so following that, I talk a bit about the Japanese influence in um, my, ch my childhood reading. Um, so the second section of this chapter traces the history of the Japanese influence in the industry and creation of comic books in Taiwan. So starting from the period uh, of time during 1985 and 1945, when Taiwan was colonized by Japan, education was in Japanese and artists had learned to draw in Japanese styles, which then got passed on to uh, newer generations of artists. So starting from then to the time after the Second World War, when uh, local comics, um, there was a time when, when they really um, were quite prosperous. Uh, but then due to various reasons, policies and censorship that were intended to provide the right teaching, quotation mark, right teaching to children, um, somehow destroyed the local market and um, inadvertently led to the dominance of uh, manga or manga style comic books until today. So as you can see from my slide, the background of this picture, um, if you are familiar with manga, you would be able to pick up the, the, the style, the, the way facial features are drawn, the hair, um, and even the uniform that this girl is wearing is quite Japanese, um, quite a Japanese school uniform style. And the arrangement of panels, the focus, the uh, uh, movements, the extreme close shot, of um, continuous movements, which sometimes um, implicate a change of emotions as well. So, so this this picture, this double straight, uh, is actually from a, com a local comic book called Blossom. Uh, Chinese is by Hua Bai Se, which I discussed more in section five. Um, this is drawn by a local artist, but it is um, considered the, the art style is quite heavily influenced by manga. Um, so moving on to third, the third section, I then uh, discuss uh, manga and its controversial status, comics as in general, um, have been seen as a popular culture text, but uh, considered as inferior literature. Um, so one example can be seen in the uh, scholarly discussion of the development of children's literature in Taiwan, where the only mention of comics is an early children's newspaper called Mandarin Times, which emphasized the use of comic strips to attract children and provide quick and engaging pathways to Chinese education. In other words, it was included um, in scholarly record of uh, children's literature only because it provides a pathway to the Chinese language education. And at different times of the history, there were various movements to ban manga in Japan, in Taiwan, in the UK and elsewhere. Never this, the global population of manga has made, uh, has had some positive impact on its social status, and especially in Japan itself. Um, it is now considered a form of national treasure and uh, a cultural ambassador. In Taiwan, however, um, comics continue to face struggles. So uh, to illustrate this, uh, uh, in section four, I analyzed the judge reports of an annual reading campaign held by the government since 1982. 
um, comics were added as a new category in 1996. And from the historic reports of this reading campaign, we can see two prominent struggles of local comic artists and the industry. So the first one is the threat of foreign comics in market share, especially manga. And the second one is the legitimacy of comic status as educational material. And from the judge report, we can observe lots of frustrations about um, low production in terms of quantity and poor quality of local comics. Um, we can also see that the criteria of selection um, emphasizes clear educational messages as essential for recommended texts. Um, so recently, there has been a change of attitude toward installing critical reading skills among children instead of avoiding certain issues for the sake of uh, protecting children, which I consider as a significant milestone in literacy education as it reflects our perceptions of children in terms of their capacity, their cognitive and effective capacities. Um, so in summary, these reports reveal a recurring issue of the struggles among local comics for uh, social recognition. First, recognition by publishers in terms of returns in investment. Second, the recognition by the authority in terms of educational values. And the third, uh, recognition by child readers in terms of entertainment values. Um, so from the recommended text in the 2019 reading campaign, I selected uh, Blossom, uh, one of the recommended comic books, to demonstrate that comic books are not inferior literature. Um, um, by con in contrast, words and pictures can work in a very complex way to construct meanings which provide rich material for the development of visual literacy. And they can also be used to explore the um, embedded social ideology and to have a dialogue with children regarding how they might um, deal with similar issues in their lives. Um, so I heard the bell, Zui. Uh, I'll wrap up here. Um, so to conclude this chapter, I reflect on the continuous struggles of comic books in the Taiwanese literacy education, um, conflicts between what teachers and parents want, what the authority want, what children want. And so often teachers and parents, what they want would be more example oriented and textbook related material. What the authority wants is usually clear educational messages. And what children want really is to be able to relate to the characters and level of issues that they may find difficult in real life. So what we have seen in the history is that the perception of children being immature and vulnerable has led to a fear of comics and lasting debates about what children's comics should be like. Uh, without directly consulting children regarding what they have enjoyed about reading comics and what they have learned from the experience. So I argue that there is a need to include comic books in the development of literacy pedagogies as part of the professional development for teachers to raise the awareness and appreciation of comics as a unique narrative form. Okay, so that's about this chapter. Thank you very much. I hope you will get the book to read. Thank you, Yishan. Right. Um, so these are the chapter authors in the book. Uh, um, again, thank you all for sharing. Um, we've got a couple of questions uh, before we, we tie this up. Uh, I think, uh, Faye, would you like to answer the question that was asked uh, previously in the first session by Mutaka? OK, sure. Um, please clarify or remind me of your question. If I, I'm not exactly answering your question. Um, right. So I. I believe what you were asking me is about uh, why, uh, what texts are being re read in our literature uh, curriculum, or why is that a, a sort of a marginalized subject? Um, so I, I'm talking specifically about uh, literature in English, and the perception is that um, students first need to have uh, a certain level of English competency before they can handle that uh, that subject. And therefore, a lot of the schools judge that uh, their students actually don't have enough English to handle the subject and therefore have chosen not to offer it. And the other 
factor is that um, we used to have two public exams, like the O levels and the A levels. And then in 2012 onwards, they have merged the two uh, secondary uh, exit exam into one, which makes it uh, which makes this one uh, public exam much more high stake. And therefore, uh, people tend to not take a subject that is considered more risky, uh, uh, less certain to be able to get good grades because they have the impression that literature is a very objective subject. If you've written something that the marker doesn't like, you won't be able to score high marks. And instead, if you choose subjects like, say, accounting or a more like science uh, or a science subject, then as long as you work hard and you give the model answer, then you can get like high grades. So there's also this factor of um, this uncertainty of whether you can score high marks, which deters students from taking that subject. So the numbers of the students taking that subject on the, in the public exam level is like dwindling massively. And because of that, many of the schools also don't offer that subject in the junior level. Um, whether or not that is because Hong Kong also have, uh, whether there are like other forms of literature that dominates the, uh, the literary tradition. Um, I think the situation in Hong Kong is that, of course, we uh, our students have to learn both Chinese and English. Uh, so, and uh, there are I wouldn't say it's because of the the oral tradition that is taking dom uh, taking precedence over the print culture because uh, the Chinese uh, culture and also the English culture are pretty heavy on print. Um, so it's it's not that. I think it's just the um, the perception that um, uh, that people believe that literature subjects are are, are difficult to score high grades and and Hong Kong being such a practical society as it is and. Uh, as a school subject, it is it is quite a marginalized one. So I hope this is answering your question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Faye. Um, I've got a question in the chat box. Uh, Joan, you have asked the question, has your literacy work informed educational policies, seeing that there exists inequality in acquisition of literacy resources? Um, and any one of us can take that, but I, I would like to just quickly comment that from the certainly in the Malaysian context, which is why I, I you know, conceived this book, because um, we don't speak about literacy enough. In Malaysia, um, a lot of what we talk about or what we think about in terms of reading uh, comes under the umbrella of language education. And, and it it's only because it's functional. It's 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 the most practical thing to do. Uh, you know, I, I said in the talk of the presentation that a child like me growing up in Malaysia had to deal with three different languages. So, um, you know, I don't think there is enough sort of space um, in the curriculum that that is devoted to literacy in and of itself. Um, and, and this is why um, I, I, I wanted to write this book. I wanted this team of us to come up with this and in fact to kickstart this conversation, to initiate this conversation that uh, certainly in Malaysia, you know, reading isn't just about, you know, ESL or Malay language or, you know, Mandarin, but reading is beyond uh, uh, um, letters. It's beyond huruf, um, you know, and um, I think um, uh, Selfie mentioned multimodalities and indeed I think many of us are also trained in, in that kind of light understanding that literacy is multimodal. You can be literate in fabric, you can be literate in music, you can be literate in, um, um, you know, ingredients. So, you know, so we need to sort of kick open that door to speak about literacy in, 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 in sort of broader, uh, broader ways, yeah, in meaning making. Does anyone want else want to provide any answers from your countries? Authors? No, all right. Uh, we've got some comments. Joan, you were saying institutional standards, yes, which might be construed by novice readers as the only correct reading practice, uh, limiting reading possibilities and trajectories. Yes, I think well, one of the difficulties, and this is again why the book uh, has sort of, well, there are three sections to the book. Um, the first section is um, about practice reading and, and practice within home and school environment. The second section has this reader text context uh, be between literature, reader text and context. And then the third part is, um, is about more about policy. So the literature bit uh, does precisely talk about this. Yeah, where does literature fit in all of this? How do we think about uh, reading vis-a-vis uh, -vis 
the literature subjects and and very commonly there is always that issue of elitism yeah is, is literature only meant for a small group of people yeah so again i think our authors um, do try to reflect on that to show that it's it can it can sometimes be misconstrued that way but in fact it, it can be a powerful place to talk about uh, reading all right thank you all for the nice comments um, someone asked where we can get the book. Uh, the book is not yet out. Um, we are, in fact, this team of us, we are, uh, I'm, as I'm the editor, I'm working on the final edits of the book. Um, all the chapters have come through. So um, Routledge uh, is the publisher. We hope, if anything, late this year, but if not, then it's early next year. Yeah. Um, so what we'll do is, of course, when the book does come out, we can always, uh, always, always just drop a line to inform uh, all, all of you. Yeah, uh, but again, much more than just a book. Really, it's 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 us wanting to come together to talk about uh, reading. Um, some of us have learned this in in our studies. Um, you know that reading is is transactional. Uh, you know, using Rosenblatt's theory, you know, of, of transactional reading, that it is unique, and each one of us, you know, has our own trajectory for it. And if I think schools continue to be too, um, you know, sort of, sort of straight jacketed in the way we, we talk about reading or we do reading or we assess reading, then I think it doesn't do uh, anyone any favor. Yeah, and especially children who are in marginalized spaces, uh, I think they they are the ones who stand to lose the most. Yeah. Any questions from the floor? No, right. So, so what we will do is, um, you know, we, we can certainly end the the session here. But we would like to, um, perhaps keep everyone informed. Those of you who have attended today's session, um, keep you all informed. If in future there could be perhaps uh, special interest groups, um, or you know, just discussions, or perhaps um, you know, forums, online forums, for us to continue to keep this conversation going, to just get this. Um, you know, to talk about reading beyond letters, beyond characters, beyond uh, semiotic systems, but, you know, to, to understand reading as meaning making um, and to see if, you know, um, that 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 can then perhaps affect policy. So to the question earlier that, that was asked, has it affected policy? I think in many parts of Asia, it hasn't quite yet affected policy um, as it should. Yeah. So, so yes, I think um, I shall close the session. Thank you all for joining us and for staying on uh, till the end of the session. Again, uh, from University Technology Patronas, uh, I would like to say thank you uh, also to the organizers and to those who are supporting behind the scenes. There are a group of people trying to make sure that um, our technical um, uh, um, expertise or the technical, uh, uh, there are no technical problems to this. Yeah. So again, thank you everyone. So again, you've got our email addresses. Uh, please do get in touch if you want to have further discussions about this. Thank you all. Have a good day, evening, night. Stay safe. We'll let you know when the book is out. <laughs>